Mr. Quick Spot. Oh, yeah. All right. I tell you what, the er a person who believes that this wasn't set up by our own government is an idiot. And around the 1950s, it appeared again for students as a way to measure what they learned in high school. So, in its, in its conception, for students, it was always a measure from beginning to end of your scholastic year. It was never a measure of what you learned in high school. During the, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, been, it's had many changes, but one thing has remained constant. It has always been a reading test, and that's something you need to write down. It has always been a reading test. It hasn't always been a math test. It hasn't always been a writing test, but it has always been a reading test. So there's two things we can understand from that. One, that if they've been testing it as a reading test since the 1950s, that's almost 70 years, then they must be good at it. That's number one. Number two, something must have happened if they were so concerned about reading. And that is very simple. In the 1950s, you saw the introduction of television and movies. And people stopped reading. Before that, people read, and they read quite a bit. But after the 1950s, people stopped reading as much because now you can watch TV. You can uh, even see the books that you would have read. Now they're movies now. So you didn't have to read as much. So universities were getting students who didn't know how to read. So they needed some kind of measurement to tell whether or not that student coming to my university knows how to read. The ETS, I don't know if you, you probably don't know this organ, this company, but it is a company. It creates, administers, grades, the SAT, not College Board. The ETS makes it, administers it, and grades it. When you pay for the SA, to take the SAT test, you're paying ETS. You're not paying College Board. College Board is a non-profit organization. They don't make a dime from the SAT. So, well, if they don't make any money from the SAT, then what, what do they do? It's simple. They collect data. When you sit down for the SAT, you are a lab rat. A lab rat. You know what a lab rat is, right? You're part of an experiment. Uh, experiment. Every time you bubble in a bubble, you help their research. They take that data and they do different things with it. They can tell you 1990, no, yeah, 1998, the difference between the reading level of a student in Egypt and a student in South Korea. If you needed that information, for whatever reason, you need that information, you can go to the College Board and ask them, and they can tell you. Just like they can tell you in 2015, the difference between the reading level of someone in Egypt, because you want to know about you know, the North Africa, and someone in South Africa. What's the reading level in the, in the students there and there? Just to see if there's a difference. They can give you that information. So that's what they do. So they don't make any money from it, but they do have the data. So that makes them the go-to organization for data about education. That's what College Board is. Now, this, a lot of this data is open to you if you so choose to go through College Board's website. You can see data that they have collected that relates to you. What's the percentage of a student taking the SAT and then taking it again, what's the percentage of their score to go up 50 points? They have that information. They can tell you what you should expect. When you take an SAT course, how much should you expect to get? How many points should that course increase you? And I got a funny story about that. I had, I had uh, somebody called me. They wanted to get their reading score up for their daughter. 
Uh, actually, the score, overall score, but especially the reading because it was the lowest. And I was like, okay, no problem. So we did, I don't know how many lessons we did, maybe eight lessons, not many. I mean, you know, how much, how much can you do with the reading section? It's like, so they took the test again. So I got the call. You know, I always get the call after the score comes. Okay, the score came back. I'm saying, good, I'm talking to the father. He said, well, yeah, um, well, she did increase. She increased 100 points on the reading. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, party time. Yeah, all right. He said, but uh, I was expecting more. I'm like, what? That's because he didn't know that the average increase for the reading section is 20 points. And as you go up 20, 40, 60, 80, the percentiles of the, the, the group that you're in become smaller and smaller and smaller. A hundred points. He should have been, he should have visited me at my house and gave me a hug. I mean, but he didn't know. He thought, you know, there was a problem. Right, so, you know, I didn't want to deal with him anymore, obviously. So, my challenge to you is to go to the College Board site and go to the professional area of the site and read all the data that they, they have about increases and decreases and what you should, should expect, even based on you being in Africa, you being in Egypt, and all of that, non-native speakers and native speakers, all they got all the information for you. How could you really help with the reading The teaching the strategy. That's it. Once, you te once, once you teach the strategy, it's not much more you can do other than, you know, make the student read a lot and, and, and make this parent stand over them while they read. I mean, this is, it's not a whole lot. Okay. What does it measure? It me what does it measure? It measures the, the passages, the reading passages. It measures your ability to read and think. That's easy. It measures your ability to read and think. But wait, we got to remember that this is an aptitude test. And the last point I didn't really, I, didn't, I ran over, and this last point here is that the College Board denies that it's an aptitude test. That, they say, no, it's not. They say the A doesn't stand for aptitude, and you, you ask them what it stand for, they don't know. So they stopped trying to rectify the acronym SAT, and now they came up with a whole other name for the SAT test. Whatever. Well, it measures your ability to read and think carefully. The, th the part that's missing here is it actually measures how well you develop that ability since the first grade. Because an aptitude test to some people is, is, a, is, is a racist test. Because not everybody has the same art obtains the same level of education. Even if your level of education changed, maybe you went from a bad school to a good school. Maybe your first five years of schooling was a bad school and your last five years was a good school. Well, would you be on the same level of a person who went to a good school? No. The entire time. Are discriminatory. In America, we say racist, because that's usually what it boils down to. Discriminatory. So it's discriminating those who were not able to get a good education from first to 11th grade, if you call it an aptitude test. But if you don't call it an aptitude test, then you're saying that everybody, no matter what your education was from first to 11th grade, you all have the same opportunity. So let's. I don't know. That's up to the ministry to decide. Okay, the passages range from 100 to 850 words. Now, I know that may not seem like a lot, but that is a lot if you lose concentration in the middle of reading. Everybody should be writing notes. Everybody should be taking notes. Because I'm going to tell, tell you one thing for sure. When I'm a tutor, I love to find, I love to visit a student who knows nothing about the SAT. Because I go through all of this. I spend a whole lesson just going through this stuff. I like that. You don't know anything about the SAT? All right, so let's, uh, let's get to work here. Some things you need to know. 
Uh, yeah, I'm going to play around for about an hour teaching you some basics about the SAT because you didn't bother to learn any basics. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> that's, why, that's what I'm here for. Okay. 100 to 850 words passages are taken from a variety of areas, all of our favorites. All of our favorites. The humanities, natural sciences, social studies, and literary fiction. Now, if you're a literary fiction person, that's great. Just hope that there's a passage when you take the SAT lit. But if that's the only thing you like, I hate to tell you that you're going to find those passages far and few between. Nonfiction is the love that you should have. Because the rest of them are nonfiction. It's nonfiction information about stuff you probably know nothing about. Zero. The molecular structure of a fly's wing cell. And that's it. That's the whole passage. <laughs> and that, that's what they do because the point is not whether you know the content. The point is whether you can navigate what the author is trying to say. So these are the fun. Now the styles vary, but they're basically narrative, which is probably going to only be non uh, the fiction. Then you got the argumentative, where they're trying to you know prove a point. You know all about argumentative stuff, and expository, where you're just giving some information about some random things that you never knew about before. So those, those are, are the four main text areas, the three main styles, and of course, you may be hit with what we call a dual passage, meaning two passages that you have to kind of compare and contrast, which, without a doubt, are the most difficult on questions on the entire SAT, not just the reading section. Paired passages. You can only hope that they get rid of those before you have to take it. So a lot of students ask me, you know, what should I read over the summer? There you go. Oh, it's the kind of stuff you should read. A lot of students ask, what should I read in order to prepare? There, you, there it is. The literary fiction, you've been reading that. You've been shoved, that's been shoved in your face since you've been in school. The stuff you've been skipping is the chapters you were supposed to read in social studies, chapters you were supposed to read in science books, chapters. I'm sorry, but I don't see how we're going to read this. Well, you know, some people haven't read it all. So some people can improve just by trying to in, in, uh, improve your reading over the next year. Some people have just been a reader, so they don't have anything to improve upon. I mean, they can perfect what they already do, but they, they're not in, like, some serious danger here. Huh? But still, yeah, if you, you just like to read. I mean, it's just something you do. But, Mr. Quick, I still don't, if you read a lot, if you Then you need a, a strategy. And that's what we're about to go over. Okay, the types of questions. And all of these types of questions you've been confronted with and during these 20 assessments that I gave first, second, and third quarter. Main idea questions, primary purpose questions, detailed questions, inference questions. Y'all want to write this? Man, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. All right. Can't. Vocabulary so questions. These are the types of questions. Now, we have to go over each type individually so you can understand <coughs> what it's asking. Because that's one of the biggest problems. When you ask a question and you don't understand what it's asking. And I'm not talking about the content of the passage itself. You just don't understand what the question is asking you. So we're going to go over these. But before we go over these, I want to give you some warning signs. Two to warning signs. So that you can assess the tutor. If you get some of these warning signs, you might want to get another tutor. Number one, 
avoids the reading session. Or for you, that's a deal breaker. That's it. So don't come teaching me no grammar. Especially when I know that it's going to be reading and math. Now, now, the majority of the tutors, they avoid the reading section. And they can do that because they got three sections. They hook you up with their math homie. We're going to give you a real high math score. And they said, we're going to focus on the reading. Don't worry. I mean, on the writing. Don't worry about the reading. Well, they can't do that now. So if you get somebody avoiding the reading section, you need to cut them off. Does not explain the why. When you're going over the questions on the reading set, does not explain the why. Now, of course, <clears throat> you don't want to hurt yourself by having them to explain each and every question because then you won't do a whole lot of tests with them. But, I mean, you've got to every once in a while stop and have something explained. But if they don't want to explain anything, then what good are they? I mean, you know, if they can't explain why you got it wrong, then what? Or why it's the answer it is. I mean, what good, what good are they? Idioms and vocabulary. They don't know basic idioms. Basic idioms that you know. Vocabulary, they can't tell you anything means. Are they telling you it's wrong? He's sitting there like, I know that doesn't mean that. And that's the danger, because if they're telling you wrong stuff, and you second guessing what you know, then they actually can be making it worse instead of making it better. Does not teach his or her strategy first. So I sit there and take a lot of tests with you, but don't want to teach you the strategy until, I don't know, a month later or something? No, you got to learn the strategy first so that you can apply the strategy as you take the test. This is very important. It does not explain why the strategy is used. Why use this strategy? Why can't I just do it the way I want to do it? And it has to be reasonable what they're saying. Because they may have a totally different strategy than one you read in a practice book or one of the strategy I'm going to give you. But it may be a good strategy. So you got to understand why. Another reason why you want to get them to explain the strategy first is because there are some idiot strategies out there that are recipes for failure. Reading the first and last sentence of every paragraph, forgetting about what's in the middle. Reading the first and last paragraph, forgetting about the others. So forth and so on. Skipping certain questions. I mean, you know, just crazy strategies that don't make a whole lot of sense. So you want to get their strategy first, because if that's their strategy, then you can you know, say, well, thank you, but no thank you. I don't think I want that one. Knows very little about the history of the SAT. <clears throat> Why? Because they only heard about it when they found out from one of their homies that they can make money off of it. <laughs> well, the S what? The S, yeah, SAT, yeah. So he said, write that down and they'll you know, say, yeah, I do that say, yeah, I can do you some SAT. Come on. Come on over. <laughs> we can do SAT all day. Uh, does not understand why the satin has changed. You're going to be faced with the new sat. If they are old sat tutor and they own, I don't know why the thing is changing. If they can't tell you because, you know, the CEO of the SAT. He was a part of an organization that developed the Common Core, and he decided he wanted to make the Common Core mirror the SAT to force the, the remaining state that had not accepted the SAT to accept the SAT, so forth and so on. And he, 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 okay, let's continue here. That's just some extra information. Main idea questions. They ask you about the passage in general. Basically, you must read the entire passage. If you don't read the entire passage, you can't say 100% that you know what the entire passage was about. Because sometimes you may get confused the main idea of a paragraph with the main idea of the passage. And then that would be, now you're talking about guessing at some questions. Any good strategy begins with that one. Read the entire passage. 
Any weak strategy says the opposite. So to answer that uh, Rock now, I think it was your question about what would increasing the amount of your reading for right now do? It, is, it will make you able to get through passages in a timely manner because you got to at least get through them. You'd be surprised at what, will you be surprised when you're under pressure, what you can remember. The problem is I think that's why I tried. That's why I say you'd be surprised at what you remember when you're under pressure. And you will be under pressure. You will be under pressure. You'd be surprised. You might remember everything. Must consider everything you've read in the passage. And a lot of this stuff, just the pressure of being there Saturday in a place where you're only focused on this test in this passage at that moment, believe me, everything is in your favor to remember a whole lot. No, no, no. I thought we went over that. Nope. Not doing that. Uh, okay. Let's continue here. Primary purpose questions. My favorite. My favorite. Primary purpose. Because that's actually what we started the year out with. We were trying to figure out what was the purpose of, Walt, of Henry David Thoreau and writing Walt. What was his purpose? Anybody remember what his purpose was? Huh? His purpose for us, the reader. Uh, I understand that we, uh, we, we don't need to um, be very materialistic. We live off very little things. Okay, so I want you, he, he, I like what he said. I like what he said. I want you to look at these, what I call purposes. And I want you to tell, tell me which one of these apply to Henry David Thoreau's purpose. <coughs> and what he was trying to do with Walden. Yes. To inform. To analyze a character. Uh, I'm actually waiting for Ali. I think it's persuade. To persuade. Okay. That's your. That, that's your. Point. I think it's But didn't you just say to inform? Oh, okay. He okay. 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 So. To analyze the situation. Now look, I'm talking about the entire book. Okay. Alright, so no, wait, I need you to listen to what I just asked you because this is a really important point. Now, if we were talking about a particular chapter, a particular part of a chapter, she said analyze the situation could be possible. But I asked you the entire book. So that changes, that should change it to inform. So she's going to go with Mr. Um, LeBan. No. Wait, come on. All right. Can we all decide on one, please? Raise your hand, say this way. All right, so here we go. All right, so I, I, I guess I have to agree with uh, Persuade. Uh, there are some parts where he does inform, especially the breakdown of the house and how much it costs and all that stuff. And that's it, too. There might be two right questions, but you get to Two questions, yes. But each question will have its own answers. Now, one question could be about the chapter economics. One question could be about the book, Walden. I mean, I mean, two right answers, but you have to pick the, pick the best. No, 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 never two right answers. No, no. There'd be two questions that's asking the same thing. Like, one could be asking about a chapter in Walden, another could be asking about Walden in general. You have to consider Walden in general when you're answering that question. And if you're asking, being asked a question about the chapter, then you have to consider that chapter and what 
happened in that chapter. Okay. All right. So we got that. No. No. Come on. Come on. That's okay. We got three lessons today, but uh, we gotta. We we gotta. Uh, okay, so I, I'm sorry, guys. Sorry. Detailed questions. <clears throat> they say that these questions are the closest you get to reading comprehension questions. Those questions you're used to. I don't know about that, but that's what they say. But these questions ask you about something specific, very specific in the passage. But not word for word. You never see word for word, but the meanings be very, very specific. It may pick out a, a, a phrase or, or something like that, but it'll be asking you about something very specific in the passage. Detailed questions. So they say that, I don't know if that's absolutely true, but I guess. If you're looking for what the kind of questions you had in first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, yeah, maybe detailed questions are it. But for sure, <clears throat> they test your ability to remember. Your ability to remember what you read definitely comes from these detailed questions. Because if you don't remember, then you gotta go back. And you gotta read again. <clears throat> That's where the time comes in at. Okay. Can't write word for word, you know that. Inference questions, the most difficult ones, and the ones they promised they would remove from the new SAT. I, I didn't see that when we went over the, the sample test. I didn't see that at all, actually. So I don't know what kind, maybe they removed certain types of inference questions, but they didn't remove all of them. I saw that, or we saw it together. We went over the test together, didn't we? Yeah, I didn't see that. It tests your cognitive ability, something I've been trying to improve for the entire year. Your cognitive ability, that's your ability to think about what you have read, to analyze what you have read, to look deeper, to read in between them. Huh? No, this is that period. Inference questions. Those are the most difficult. You know, remember I told you that, you know, some tutors have strategies of skipping questions? Well, this is one of their strategies. To skip all the questions that have words like imply, infer, suggest. They tell you right off the bat, just skip those. Don't work. Now, there's two reasons they tell you to do that. One, because they assume you're not intelligent. The second reason is because they don't want you to know that it's really them not intelligent. Because they would have to answer questions about those questions. <laughs> they don't have to do that. They just skip that. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about that. <clears throat> if you have a tutor, hey, look, I'm not talking about your tutor, okay? Say, like my teacher said, you know, I'm not trying to make any enemies. <laughs> Don't try to answer these questions based on your own thoughts, your own feelings, your own view of the world. That is not what you want to do. As we have done over and over in this class, we have tried to focus on what Henry David Thoreau was trying to do, was thinking, was trying to get across. And we try to leave our own thoughts out of it. Well, you have to do this with these types of questions. Because they don't ask you, you know, they don't ask you what you think about what you just read. They ask you, what do you think the author was trying to say? What do you think the author was trying to say with this line, with this paragraph, with this word, 
blah, blah, blah. What was he trying to suggest? What was he implying? I've asked some of those same questions during our reading discussions in here and with the, you know, the discussion point questions, so forth and so on. So we have to remember that. We all have to think about how the author has written, what he has written. We have to think about that. <clears throat> Always, it's about the author. It's about the author. Look, listen, it's about the author. It's not about the content. It's not, it's about the author. It's not about the content. It's about the author. It's about the author. It's not about you. It's not about you. The questions are not asking you about what you believe. What does the author believe? Now, you might be reading something where you have an opinion on. Uh, I don't know. The, the internet. Ah, teenagers in the internet. Maybe the author believes that teenagers should be on the internet. But you have a different opinion. You can't let that infect your choices in your answer. I mean, you know, in the answers. So we have to focus. If he said, that, you know, and he explained how it hurts teenagers, okay, that's what he said. So you got to stick with what he said. It's, what, it's time. We got two more lessons. Hope we can do it. This is an Islamic school. I'll talk about tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's rolling the hard way. We don't want to roll quite that hard. We want to get one of them little minibuses. who believes that this wasn't set up by our own government is an idiot. Everybody's gone out of their mind. Welcome to Mr. Quick Star. Oh yeah. All right. All right.